A new prospect welcome to RTB 2021 for October the 23rd, 2021. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, so our text for today, we've got 2 Kings 4, 1 Timothy 1. We'll start in the book of 1 Timothy once again. Uh, then we have Daniel 8, starting in some really interesting and hard uh, portions of the book of Daniel. And then finally, we have Psalm 116. Uh, so why don't we start with Daniel? Uh, so Daniel is uh, is a couple of transitions that are going on here in the book of Daniel. So um, I, I think I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about Daniel, that Daniel has uh, some sections in it that are Aramaic, that are written uh, in Aramaic. Now, the majority of the Old Testament written in Hebrew. There are some written in Aramaic, uh, just here in Daniel, by the way, and then also in the book of Ezra. Uh, and the reason, of course, is that uh, those are books that kind of emerged from that Persian period where Aramaic was the lingua franca of the day. That's what people were speaking. Uh, well, this significant portion of Daniel, Daniel that's in Aramaic, ends in chapter 7. Uh, and so there is a transition going into chapter 8, although uh, what chapter 8 seems to be doing is carrying on a little bit of the vision of this same um, the same idea that was in chapter seven. So remember what chapter seven was about, this vision of these four beasts coming up from the water and then the son of man uh, judging them ultimately, uh, having a kingdom that will not be passed away uh, and, and having that kingdom uh, given to him by the ancient of days. Well, when we get to chapter eight, uh, chapter eight through, really chapter eight through 12 seems to work out some of the details of those individual kingdoms. Um, and the sequences of the, the events and things like that are a little bit hard to discern. Um, they are speculative. So I want to say that from the start that we are just kind of uh, speculating here on, on some of what Daniel was talking about here. Uh, but I think uh, that Daniel is really focusing on the two kingdoms in the middle, uh, the Persian Empire, and the uh, empire of Greece that would emerge uh, after the Persians. And specifically, um, when Greece replaces Persian power, remember that it's under Alexander the Great. Um, and uh, this, um, this power that he has ultimately after Alexander dies, after only a short uh, reign, right, as, as this great world uh, emperor, uh, who conquers everything pretty much, um, he dies very shortly after that. Uh, and uh, as a very young man, and his kingdom is divided. And ultimately, the two, um, the two successors of Alexander, uh, his two generals that uh, come into play most for the Jews is Ptolemy, and it's spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, I think I'm spelling that right, and then Seleucus, um, S-E-L-E-C-U-S. Uh, the Ptolemies had control over Judah initially. Uh, their, their center of power was in Egypt. Um, in fact, they had adopted Egyptian practices, even had Egyptian pharaohs. It's fairly... Um, fairly peaceful time for Judah. Uh, not a lot is known from this time period um, of what the Jews experienced, although uh, it was also during this time period that the, that the Septuagint uh, began to be translated in Alexandria in Egypt uh, from the original Hebrew into the Greek. So the Old Testament is translated into Greek or the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and it was, uh, but ultimately the Ptolemies lose power over the region to the Seleucids. Um, and the, the most famous of the Seleucid emperors was a guy named Antiochus. Uh, and Antiochus, um, of course, was uh, one who, and we could go into a long history here, we don't really have time, but is probably the one that's being referred to in this text, the foreshadowing of his, uh, of his rule uh, he's the one that has the hubris that reaches to heaven and to God in verses 10 and 11. Um, and he was the one ultimately whose oppressive policies, uh, which included things like outlawing the reading of Torah and circumcision. And if you circumcised your children, you were punished in these, uh, these 
uh, horrendous ways. Um, he's the one who, who was basically trying to turn the Jews into Greeks. He was, and his theory was, I think, uh, the more we um, make culture uh, standardized, uh, we lose our distinctives in our religion and our culture, the more we will be unified as a nation to be able to fend off uh, other powers in the world, namely the Romans who were starting to, to gain power during this time of Antiochus. By the way, this is like uh, from 200 BC onward. Well, in the, in the uh, 180s uh, BC, it was when Antiochus really started to, to uh, press the Jews. And this is, of course, what ultimately leads to the, um, to the Maccabean revolt in the 160s BC, uh, when uh, the Jews actually attain independence. And this is what, of course, the Jews celebrate during uh, Hanukkah. Uh, lots of stuff that we could discuss there, but this is kind of what is being discussed, I think, and foreshadowed here in Daniel 8 and ultimately in Daniel 9, too, although there's some even more confusing things in Daniel 9 that we'll get to in, in, uh, in tomorrow's discussion. So that's Daniel uh, 8. So let's, let's talk about, um, let's move on to 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, what we have in 2 Kings 4 is a series of, of different uh, uh, examples, I guess, of the miracle working of Elisha uh, begins with the famous story of his uh, uh, providing oil uh, for this uh, for this woman, actually providing just money in order that her sons not be taken into uh, a debtor's prison and, and be taken as slaves. Um, and Elisha uh, provides oil for her that she can then sell and pay her debt. Uh, then you have the story of the, Sh uh, the Shunamite, uh, Shunamite woman, um, and very similar to some earlier, the earlier story of Elijah. In fact, a lot of these stories are very similar uh, to what Elijah did, and I think showing, purposely so, showing uh, that God's spirit and God's uh, miraculous working was working through Elisha just as much as it was Elijah. Um, and in this case, the, the Shunammite's uh, woman, the Shunammite woman's son is, uh, has this illness and dies. Elijah comes and raises him from the dead, just as Elijah raised somebody from the dead. Uh, then you have this story of the poisonous stew, uh, where he is able to purify this, this stew and to bring forth life. Uh, and then finally, uh, he multiplies bread uh, for uh, people. Uh, these these people who did not have any. So uh, you have some stories here, I think, that reaffirm uh, the authority of the prophet, which again, very significant in that time period of the exile that First Kings is being written to. But also in a way, these are prefiguring uh, much of what Jesus would do as well uh, to show something of his prophetic authority. Uh, in particular, that last story of the feeding of uh, the multiplying of the bread to feed people. So uh, some echoes forward and backward in this story. And I think significant in showing God's, uh, the authority of the prophetic word and the power of the prophetic word. That brings us to, uh, let's go over to, we've done Daniel 8 and we've done 1 Kings 4. So let's go, 2 Kings 4, let's go over to, to um, we'll go to Psalm 116. So Psalm 116, continuing on in the Egyptian Hallel, remember these are, were, these are psalms that are all sung during the uh, Passover celebration, Psalm 113 through 118, focusing on the praise of God for his mighty deliverance during that time. And this one is an is a interesting psalm because it's one of the clearest demonstrations of God's uh, sovereignty over death in the Old Testament. Um, so it begins with a, a rather shocking statement. Uh, it says that, that I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications. Now, uh, that's the way, at least my translation has it. That's not exactly the way the Hebrew, original Hebrew had it. Uh, and I, you may have heard me say this before, but there are no occasions in the Old Testament where anyone ever says, I love the Lord, using that Hebrew word ahav, which is the Hebrew word for uh, covenantal love. Uh, the Hebrew authors all throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament, 
express an extreme reticence to say personally, I have this covenant fidelity and faithfulness and commitment to God. They don't say it. And they don't do it here either. Uh, the issue, if you actually look at the text, it says, I love that the Lord hears my voice um, or that the Lord hears uh, my voice and my supplications. Uh, it's not that he uh, loves the Lord. He's not expressing that uh, phrase. He, it's saying that he loves that the Lord hears, that the Lord uh, hears his voice and his supplications. Now, what's the difference? Uh, well, again, uh, the, he, the Hebrew writers would say it's, it's hubris to come before God and claim that you have this covenantal fidelity to him. Uh, they had, I think, much more um, humility than that. Uh, and I think what it also says is that, um, that now, don't get me wrong, people are in the Old Testament are commanded to love the Lord. We should love the Lord in that way, right? To be faithful to him, to be committed to him in that covenantal way, as Ahav is talking about here. Um, but uh, I think this text shows that there was, a, there was this reticence, there's this unwillingness to say that out loud. Uh, and to claim that with, with a certain amount of hubris and pride. And this text shows that. But it also shows a tremendous amount of faith uh, that God is a God who rescues, verse 8, rescues uh, my soul from death and my ears, eyes from tears and my feet from stumbling. Uh, this is one of the few places in the Old Testament that speaks of uh, in, in some very clear ways to God's ultimate victory over, over death. That's much clearer when we get to the New Testament. Uh, but God is always portrayed as one who has victory over death and control over it, uh, such that we can say in verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Uh, verse you've probably heard quoted many times that even at funerals. Uh, and the reason in which uh, that is true is because God is one who controls life and death, doesn't he? So, Psalm 116. That brings us finally to 1 Timothy 1. So 1 Timothy 1 is in the book of 1 Timothy, just as a reminder. Again, we've hit this uh, text before, but 1 Timothy, of course, is uh, First and 2 Timothy and Titus are what are known as the pastoral epistles. Uh, so they're written, in other words, they're written to pastors, to Timothy and Titus. Uh, they also are united in, in much, many of their themes. Uh, they're also united, First and 2 Timothy and Titus, in that they're written probably... Uh, well, not probably, they're written at the end of Paul's life. Um, obviously, 2 Timothy is probably one of the last uh, letters, if not the last letter that Paul writes. Um, and they're also expressing pastoral concerns uh, for the recipients, in this case, Timothy and Titus. So these are written to individual pastors. Uh, Timothy, of course, was Paul's protege and fellow missionary. Um, and uh, Titus, as we'll talk about, is one who is also overseeing the work of pastors in the island of Crete, uh, Timothy probably working in Ephesus. All three works, uh, all three of these letters have very, very much filled with practical counsel on Christian life and service, and, and even in some important instructions on things like elders and deacons. Uh, in fact, if you've ever heard a sermon on elders and deacons, uh, pastors and deacons, it's probably coming from First and Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, particularly 1 Timothy and Titus. So, um, yeah, uh, they, this is the significance of these, um, of these letters. Uh, they address some similar concerns. Uh, many, uh, both, of, both of these letters, particularly 1 and 2 Timothy and, um, themselves, are focused on uh, fighting false teaching within the church. Uh, which seems to be a, a pretty dominant theme of Paul all throughout, but especially towards the end of his life. Uh, I'm sure he felt the burden of uh, false teaching still being a, a problem in the churches that he had begun, and to really to encourage and establish the church and its leaders, both in its teaching and behavior, so that the church would uh, function appropriately as a pillar of truth uh, moving forward, even after his death. Uh, and it's there to help Paul's uh, you know, successors, Timothy and Titus here, to, uh, to uh, pass the truth down in a way that will uh, be faithful uh, to what had been delivered to them. Uh, so uh, we read through uh, this, this first chapter. Paul calls him very affectionately a true child in the faith. 
uh, in his in his uh, opening greeting here. Um, and then in verses 3 through 11, he confronts right from the start some of the false teaching, and he'll return to this again in chapter 6 uh, at the end of the letter. But uh, there's some speculation on what, what the nature of this false teaching was, but obviously uh, the speculation is probably right that these false teachings were speculations. Um, and we even see this in verse uh, 4, pay no uh, don't pay attention to myths or any genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the ministry and administration of God, which is by faith. Uh, pay attention to what we know, not to all these in those speculations. Probably some, some of the teachers, as verse 7 indicates, were also um, stating that salvation is, is through the Torah and had misunderstood the Torah. Uh, Paul says, no, the Torah is good, but you have to use it rightly. And the right use of it, of course, is a, is a way uh, to live out our faith, not as a way to uh, earn salvation in any way. Um, Paul then, of course, talks about the work of, kind of uses his, himself as an example, uh, talks about the, the miraculous work of God in his life. Uh, verse 15, probably the most famous of these verses it's a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for, for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might, Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for all those who believe in him for eternal life. So, uh, and then he closes this chapter with an exhortation of Timothy to fight the good fight. And we'll see this again in... Um, and Second Timothy, where, where Paul says that he has fought the good fight of faith and he's finished his course. Uh, and he's encouraging Timothy to do the same. So that's First Timothy. We'll talk about First Timothy 2 tomorrow. So we have a wonderful rest of the day on this day, uh, October 23rd, 2021.